Danny Frank for GNAT TV. Southern Vermont is a hub of many authors and writers. Uh, the Southern Vermont area is known for people like John Irving, uh, the great late Pearl Buck. Uh, we did an interview uh, a few months ago with another literary icon from this area, Dorothy Canfield Fisher. But today we have a contemporary of those authors and I've discovered that he lives right in <laughs> Manchester and has been in Southern Vermont for quite some time. Alex Kershaw, welcome to our show. It's great to be with you. And uh, I'm, I'm shocked that you, <laughs> you've, you've lived in Bennington for a number of years and then recently moved to Manchester, and I guess before that it was Williamstown. You, you've yeah. been in this area many years. 20 years almost. I had, a, I had a, a, a year in Mexico when I kind of dropped out and did various things, but uh, yeah, I've been in this area for 20 years, yeah, absolutely. And, and somebody as worldly as you, uh, with your background, why, why Manchester, why Southern Vermont? Uh, it's civilized, it's got a hell of a school. I mean, the, the school in Manchester, my son went to the school, uh, Baron Burton um, uh, changed his life, therefore changed my life. Um, it's um, uh, it's a beautiful place. It's unbelievably beautiful. I mean, I think it's the most beautiful part of Vermont, and Vermont is the most beautiful part of New England. And um, as someone that's spent a lot, a lot of my career reporting from all over America, I've got to tell you that, that there are not many places which are nicer to live, more pleasant, more more mellow, more more sophisticated. I don't know. It's a I feel comfortable here. That's a great validation, a great endorsement I really for I really our, feel comfortable here, our right? area. Yeah, so, you're, you're not going to find better. So, anyway. Alex Kershaw has written many books, um, and many of them deal with World War II. Uh, but he started out, you started out as a journalist, like a lot of authors do, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I, would, I worked uh, in my early 20s in London. I worked for The, the Guardian, The Independent um, Features. I wasn't a news guy. Uh, that was way too stressful for me. Um, but yeah, I, I, I started off working for The Guardian um, and when I was 23, I think. I had a wonderful time. I met my wife in London. She persuaded me to come to the US. I left when I was 28. And uh, for the last 24 years, I've been working as a journalist and writing books uh, based in the US. Now, your very first book was on one of my favorite authors uh, who I've been uh, involved with in, in terms of reading them since uh, I was a junior high school student. It was Jack London. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, amazing guy. And uh, uh, I wrote a biography. It was, uh, was kind of hard work. It, um, it's, not, I'm not, it's not the best book I, I, could have, I, could have, uh, I could write today. I mean, I was 28 when I published it, so I was really just feeling my way in some ways, but I did spend a lot of time in, in San Francisco. I sailed the waters where he sailed. I went up to Dawson City eventually and um, nosed around the areas where he wrote those beautiful short stories and Call of the Wild, which is a, a, a lyrical masterpiece today, uh, still stands up. So yeah, it was, a, it was a great introduction to Northern California, to America, and to uh, a really iconic writer and character in American history, you know, just a very, very interesting guy. Died at 40, pretty much killed himself through overeating, alcohol, drugs, you name it. Sort of the first great literary rock star in history. Made more money than anybody had ever made before. Was, lit was a celebrity author, you know, this is before TV, before, before, before electronic Hollywood. media, right? Yeah, I mean, Basically, you know, he was, yeah. he was the star, I mean, he was the guy, you know, and uh, had a, 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 just a, a rip-roaring life. You know, he covered the San Francisco earthquake, he built his own boat. You know, this crazy idea that he was going to build his own yacht and go for seven years and sail the seven seas, got half around the world and nearly died of scurvy. You know, just, just a crazy guy, um, but a, a very uh, innovative writer. He was one of the first guys to write about the environment. He was one of the first Ameri really serious American environmentalists. He was a socialist. He was a revolutionary. He, he looked at America very, in a very stark way. He pioneered the new journalism through the book The Road. Um, really, he was a remarkably productive um, really, really interesting character. So, yeah. And that his work uh, in modern times, quotes, close quotes, modern times, uh, still, I mean, 
c- compared to say a Mark Twain, for example, his his work uh, is still uh, read today and taught sure. today, yeah. uh, and and sold. I, I mean, uh, there's a market for his books. Yeah, and, and I think that you know, I think stories. That, you know, we all, we've all, a lot of people who love writing who love to read. But if you're American, in particular, you've probably read to, to Build a Fire, that classic, beautiful short story about a guy that's in you know in looking for gold. It's the winter and he. It doesn't end up too well for him, you know, and it's a, it's a beautiful, simple, lyrical uh, story. And um, I, I think that that's the enduring power of Jack London is that he was, in, in a few areas, in a few instances, he really nailed it, you know, um, really nailed it. And that's the definition of great art when you, it just feels completely, authentically powerful whenever you read it, whenever you come to it. And he, he managed that. A lot of dross. A hell of a lot of dross. So uh, Alex stuff. Kershaw, Some ultra stuff. successful, <laughs> prominent author. <laughs> you're, you're 28. You're in journalism. You're making a living. And now you're, you're making the big decision to take on a book and you pick Jack London. Why? Uh, what, was, what went into the thought to pick that subject? Well, I was in Minnesota and it was a Christmas and I was with my... Um, wife's family and it was extremely cold and on the bookshelf above the fireplace they had uh, an edition of classics and I picked up Call of the Wild and I hadn't read it since I was like 14 and, and now I'm 26 now and I, and I had cabin fever very appropriate and I read it and I was like wow it's fantastic I really enjoyed that I couldn't put it down and then I read right at the front of the book I read a bio of Jack London and I was like no way and the point was that I, I realized that his own life story was better than any story he wrote. It was so much more dramatic, so much more uh, involving and mysterious and, and enticing as a journalist. So I was like, wow, if I could approach his life in a kind of Jack London way, you know, kind of make, turn his biography into a kind of rip-roaring adventure yarn, which is what his life really was, that would be fun. So, and anyway, I, my wife was convinced, we, well, she was very, very keen on coming back to the US. She grew up in Minnesota. She spent her 20s in London. I met her in London and she said, you know, I want to go back and be a grown up in the US. I've never been, I left college and went back, to, went to London immediately. Let's go to the US. She loves California. I'd been there when she was a kid. Let's go to San Francisco. It's a beautiful city. So I ended up in San Francisco when I was 28, you know, uh, researching Jack London. But was that a big step, uh, leaving the journalism? Oh, yeah. and, it was, and it was, yeah, it was huge. Uh, yeah. Something big to swallow it was there, scary. right? Huh? Very, very, it was scary, it was terrifying. Yeah. So, but it was, the experience and the outcome was enough to propel you to a, a whole career of, of writing as an author, well, right? I, I, I couldn't work legally in the US, but I could write a book. So I didn't have a visa, I didn't have anything else, so it was like, uh, okay, I got to do it, you know. I got to make it work. It was sort of uh, sink or swim, and I didn't, I didn't drown. Put it that way. <laughs> and just as a side note on Jack London, to digress for a minute, as much as many of his books and stories have been turned into films, I don't believe there's been a film. And and you you talk about his uh, exciting life. I don't believe there's been a film made about his life. No, right? no, actually, yeah. uh, one, of the, one of the best things that happened to me when I was writing that book was that um, the director, Michael Mann, optioned my book on Jack London. Before, First book. Before it was even published. First book. I remember the check that I put in the bank like it was yesterday. <laughs> but anyway, I was very, very flattered because someone like Michael Mann, who'd made The Last of the Mohicans, sure. sort of sweeping epic. Sure. Uh, you know, he could really get that guy, get London. You sure. Know? So, yeah, no, I mean, it, it's, still, it's still out there to but be done. But yet no movie, right? There's still no movie, no miniseries. I mean, this, is, this, this is, amazes me. I can't believe it to this so day. So if there's any yeah. Hollywood yeah. producers watching yeah. me and Alex Kershaw, yeah. you, you hear there's you can opportunity get, you, can get, you, get, you get 15%. There, right? You okay. can be the agent. All ah. right. So, <laughs> so Alex Kershaw, how did we discover that World War II was such a rich abundance of... Uh, historical content, how did we come uh, upon that? I think that? it was like a pretty, pretty straightforward for me. I was like, okay, what's the greatest story of our time? It's, there's not, there isn't a bigger, more important, more dramatic, more moving, uh, more fascinating story than World War II. It's the, it's the big one. And I, very early on, was determined 
that while there were guys still alive that had been in the big one, who'd landed on Omaha Beach, who'd done these amazing things, who'd given me the world that I love so much, that had, had saved Europe, had de defeated barbarism, had done things that were most important in terms of the way I believe, the way I look at it, I was going to interview whoever I could and tell their stories because, you know, it's now, I started writing about World War II 20 years ago. And for example, in this book, The Longest Winter, is, is basically about 18 guys, the most decorated US platoon of World War II, Battle of the Bulge story. Out of those 18 guys, I interviewed 12 that all have all passed away. So we're looking at the sunset of this epic generation, this, these wonderful, wonderful people. We're looking at the last days of these people. And in five, 10 years time, there won't be anybody to talk to. So we'll have the 75th anniversary of D-Day is coming up in 2019. I'm writing a book now called The First Wave about the very first guys to land on those beaches to parachute out of planes, and they're dying every week on me. Four guys in the last six months have gone because they're 93, 94, 95, and it doesn't matter how smart you are or how healthy you are, whether you didn't drink or smoke, whatever, age comes and it grabs you and it catches you and you, you have to move upstairs. So we're looking at a history that's disappearing before our eyes, um, and I, I've loved every moment of it. It's been a fantastic privilege to write about these people that put everything on the line so that we could have democracy, civilization, so I can sit in a restaurant in Paris and have a beautiful meal. Um, I've, I'm 52 years old, almost, and I've grown up predominantly in the, I spent my, from my late 20s, the last 20 years in the US, but uh, the first 28 years I was in Europe. I'm at heart a European and I've grown up in a Europe that since, since these guys landed on Omaha Beach, since these guys shivered in foxholes, has been prosperous mostly and free and not had a war. Longest period in European history, over 70 years, they've not had a single war. And that's the legacy of these people that, you know, to the day I die, I'm going to celebrate. Absolutely. Well, it, it's just interesting that you have... Uh, discovered uh, what you just stated, and yet comparatively to other wars, whether it's the Vietnam War or the Gulf War, or uh, I don't know, the Iranian-Iraqi War, I mean, certainly there have been books on other wars. Sure, absolutely. There's, there's been a book or two recently on the uh, war in Afghanistan, but still World War II seems to hold interest and seems to be the dominant content and subject matter. And there still seems to be new stories coming out of sure, yeah, what happened yeah. Yeah, you have, you have that, that evolve, right? Even, totally, even yeah, I mean, today. T totally. I mean, you've got 14 million Americans in uniform in World War II. It's black and white. The good guys won. They defeated barbarism. They defeated the f people that invented mass murder on an unbelievable scale. 1944, in six weeks, the German, German apparatus of death murdered over 500,000 people. That's more people killed more quickly in an industrial process than ever in human history. We defeated that. We ended it. We fought 138,000 American, working class Americans, I should say, mostly, laid down their lives in Europe to liberate it. And what a job. What an achievement. And what did they defeat? Unbelievable, unimaginable evil. And that's not mess about with that. So it's black and white, it's clear. These guys are heroes. They won, and thank God they won, you know? So going into your uh, efforts on World War II, you were not concerned that maybe World War II had been overreported or already spoken for through other books and, and uh, well, uh, you know, articles? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think about that a lot. It's a fantastic question because you know, someone says to me, okay, you know, why are we gonna, why are we gonna read this book about D-Day? You're right, I'm writing a new book about D-Day right now. Why should we read about that? There's been thousands of books about D-Day, and I have to make the point, this is, there's gonna be new content in this. There's gonna be a new way of looking at it, a new slant or new information, new interviews. Um, people are, are having an inexhaustible appetite for really well-told stories about World War II. You know, if you look at the sales figures for historical nonfiction, World War II is just, far out sells almost everything else. You've got presidential history that comes second. You know, any book about Vietnam will sell probably a quarter 
I don't know the exact figures, but it's not going to sell anywhere near, even if it's a great book, it's not going to sell anywhere near a really good book about World War II because people love the genre. They love the subject. They love the history. Um, it's and, inspiring and, and in the best can, way, you know. Can we also say uh, the same, uh, maybe World War II hashtag, the Holocaust? Uh, there's still stories and content coming out of the Holocaust, right? Uh, sure, yeah. I mean, I wrote, a, I wrote a book about the Holocaust. It was a very, it's a, probably the, you know, one of the least comfortable experiences of my life. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not making that into a big deal, but I interviewed um, seven people that had been saved by Raoul Wallenberg, who in the Guinness Book of Records is noted as being the one individual who saved more lives than any other in history. Wallenberg was a Swedish diplomat. He went to Hungary in 1944, and some people say that he saved 100,000 Jewish lives. Um, I interviewed seven, seven people who were saved by, by Wallenberg, who went through unimaginable hell before they were saved by him. And yeah, the Holocaust, they, they hadn't been interviewed before. You know, there was the seven people out there that I went and talked to that hadn't spoken in detail about what, what had happened to them, this extraordinary, they were in the middle of this extraordinary story, this great epic of, a, of, a, of salvation. Yeah. So Alex Kershaw, one thing I'm hearing is all of these books and this content is developed through identifying these people and these interviews that you do with them one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one, uh, yeah. or, or, you know, the, the direct source. And of course, there's relatively very few people left now from World War II, sure. uh, from the Holocaust, uh, there's, uh, there's fewer and fewer people. Yep. Um, and, and what happens then, you know? Well, you know, thankfully, we've had a lot of very, very good historians who've been doing really great oral histories for many years now. I mean, if you go to the National World War II Museum, uh, Imperial War Museum, they have large, large collections of interviews. They've done a very good job, so there's still a lot of stories out there to be discovered. I, I often listen to things online, interviews that no one's been back to. You know, I was, I, I, a couple of weeks ago, I was uh, listening to an Imperial War Museum oral history interview that I found online uh, with a guy called Wally Parr, who was one of the guys that landed at Pegasus Bridge on D-Day. You know, and he's a working class cockney, and he tells a fantastic story about being one of the very first Allied soldiers to land in France about 15 minutes past midnight and fight to liberate that country. And his story is not being told. It's, it's there, you listen to it, you think, wow, it's, it's full of cockney jokes and details that are amazing. So there's a lot out there that is still yet to be mined. There's a lot of, a lot of richness out there. Here's another book by Alex Kershaw. And by the way, I've shown you three covers here uh, on our show. And there's, there's many uh, books that Alex Kershaw has written. And I would uh, urge you to go online to uh, look up these books, uh, uh, website, right? Alex Kershaw. AlexKershaw.com. Yep. And uh, I would urge you to read, uh, uh, you're in for some really wonderful reading here, uh, great reading uh, with uh, Alex Kershaw. What was the toughest book for you to put together? Uh, uh, I mean, the. The research process sounds excruciating uh, in and of itself, <laughs> but what was the most difficult book to date that you did? Um, I think emotionally the most difficult was The Bedford Boys because I'm basically writing about a community that had its heart broken on Omaha Beach. The 19 young men slaughtered in the first minutes, first wave, dog green sector Omaha Beach. The film Saving Private Ryan is based loosely on the story of The Bedford Boys and, and other influences too, but I think what was difficult about that was that I was walking into a small community, in Bed a rural community, Bedford, Virginia, where the wounds were still open, they were still, still difficult for people to talk about this. I interviewed widows, I interviewed fiancés who would cry in front of me. They still were very much in love with the person they lost on that beach. So it was very, it was very raw, it was kind of emotionally quite taxing. I was writing a, a lot about grief and death and uh, at the time, I, I found the story to be very inspiring and very, 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 very compelling. But there was an after effect where I would go back and find that there was a sort of emotional 
damage that I'd been, I'd, I'd experienced these people, you know, deepest wounds, their greatest losses, and that had left something in me. Um, but I was very honored and very privileged to be able to memorialize this community's great loss. I mean, the, of, uh, Bedford lost per capita, uh, that community lost per capita more guys than any other allied community on the most important day of World War II, June the 6th, 1944, the beginning of the end of Nazi Germany. Um, so that sacrifice, we, we owe those guys so much. Um, I'm a great believer in, 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 in some elements of existentialism. I'm not going to get too pretentious, but you know, some people do things in their lives that have massive, massive consequences. And they can be an 18 year old kid from the middle of nowhere in Virginia who gets, stands up, walks off that landing craft, walks through machine gun fire, miraculously manages to live and starts to liberate. Now, the consequences of those, those people that we've forgotten, they should be celebrated. And that's what I, I love writing about is saying, hey, this mattered, it, it, it matters today. The ripple effect, the, the multiplier effect is, is huge. You know? What's a project that you started and it didn't go well? You, you were running into <laughs> all of them. Every you were single running one. <laughs> into a, you were running into a dead end, or it just didn't work out. Uh, I had one about a submarine. I wrote a book called Escape from the Deep, which is about the Tang, and uh, that's the most decorated U.S. submarine of World War II. Uh, five patrols, I think, two presidential unit citations. The Captain Dick O'Kane uh, received the Medal of Honor. Uh, but that was the book I wrote after I dropped another one and I was gonna write about a different submarine. And it turned out that various members of the crew, I didn't, get, I didn't have a great rapport. So I was like, okay, um, I can't, there's only two or three guys left alive. I had been told by one guy that he was uncomfortable about talking about any of it. I didn't want to talk about any of it. He was a big source, he was one of the, he was actually the only there were only two officers left from the tank, from the, this one submarine, and he didn't want to talk. Um, so I, I, I just felt, you know, I felt this wasn't going to be worth two years of my life being a pain in the backside to these people that didn't want to talk to me. Because unless they want to talk to you and they want to cooperate, I don't get to go deep, I don't get to be open their hearts, I don't get to be trusted. And that's a big part of it. I mean, you know, I, I get very close to some of these characters. The, um, the longest winter, the the commander of that platoon, he was 20 years old on, on uh, the 16th of December 1944. He turned 21, he actually was in a, a cafe as a POW looking at a cuckoo clock and the, the minute hand hit midnight and he turned 21. And he had 18 guys under his command, half of them shot to pieces, bleeding, one guy bleeding on his, on his chest. You know, and he died about a year and a half ago and he's one of the most beautiful human beings I've ever met a wonderful, wonderful guy. And I interviewed him every day for four or five hours in a condo in Florida for, for a week. And, and it was difficult for him, you know, difficult for him to, to talk about his sense of failure, to talk about his background, his parents, what he went through in his life. Um, difficult to talk about the trauma because what I really do, what I really write about, uh, I write about trauma, I write about war, and I write about people that go into trauma and suffer trauma, and then what, how they live with it for the rest of their lives. Um, and that's, that's an important part of my work. And do you also talk to the offspring, the sons, the daughters, sure, the, yeah. the, the spouses? Um, yeah, absolutely, yeah, definitely. Um, absolutely, yeah, I mean, that's, sometimes, you, sometimes you, you learn the best things from them, you know, because you'll be in the kitchen and you know, having a cup of tea or something, and. The, the wife will say, oh, by the way, did he tell you about that? Or, you know, uh, the, yeah, absolutely. And um, it's, it's f with, uh, for example, with the Liberator, with this Felix Sparks, who was the American commanding officer of the unit that liberated Dachau. That's the, the longest standing concentration camp in Nazi Germany. I, I interviewed him for several hours over two days when he was on his deathbed. I didn't get to, he died before the book came out, but his son, and his widow and his family helped me enormously. They looked for letters. They had actually done, a couple of them had done interviews with other people with their father. They found those interviews for me. They sent the letters, the diary entries. They really gave me a lot that I couldn't get um, without them trusting me, without, I sat next to this guy's bed in his ranch house in the suburbs of Colorado and he was dying. 
Alex Kershaw, uh, there have been so many motion pictures based on World War II and, I mean, some of the ones that just quickly come to mind are movies like Patton or The Battle of the Bulge yeah. or The Dirty Dozen or The Longest Day or sure. uh, 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 Guns of Navarone. Uh, and, and now, a number of your books have been optioned for films, right? Sure, but, yeah. yeah. That one you had there. Was, no, was, no movies? No not motion yet, pictures? Not yet. I hope so. I'm waiting. I'm praying. So. <laughs> So yeah, I hope so. Maybe. And and what's the next book coming? We we touched on. Uh, it briefly. I'm writing a book called The First Wave. It's it's time for the 75th anniversary of D-Day. It's June 2019, and I take uh, I take the guys that had the most important missions, that put most on the line, that that endured the highest levels of violence, that had the most important tasks. Young combat commanders, average age 22 to 26, either a company, a battalion that sort of size, and they've got the biggest jobs. And if they don't pull them off, if they don't get it done, then the whole thing falls apart. So guys doing the most critical missions on D-Day, fighting first, fighting hardest, with the most stakes. Alex Kershaw, a resident of Southern Vermont. We're, we're thrilled to have you here in <laughs> Southern Vermont, and thank you very much for coming on to GNAT TV. This is Danny Frank for GNAT TV. Thank you.